Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at high yield paediatric rashes for finals. So just a little bit about the medicine guide. So I've got quite a few videos on YouTube now. So I've got a series on how to be successful at medical school, so how to be successful in the pre-clinical years, how to be successful during the clinical years, how to get the most out of your GP placements, how to get the most out of your hospital placements, and how to be successful in your clinical OSCEs. Also, I've got another series of videos focused on just the high yield paediatric conditions that you need for your finals, such as the high yield congenital heart disease, high yield child with mass, high yield limping child, high yield genetic conditions for finals, and high yield vomiting child. So let's get started with today's videos. So in today's video, I'm going to be looking at the top 20 high yield paediatric rashes that crop up in finals. And then I've got five practice SBAs. So today's video will work out a bit like a quiz. So each paediatric rash will be present on the screen for 10 seconds, and that will give you some time to write down your answer and think about what you think the rash could be. And then after the 10 seconds have passed, I've got a nice little summary slide explaining about the rash, what infection it's caused by and just some key tips and key pieces of information that you need to get the highest score possible. So let's get started with our first one. So what is this rash? And I'll give you 10 seconds or you can pause the screen. It's entirely up to you. Okay, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of a meningococcal rash, and this is something that's very, very important because it is a life-threatening condition. So the key piece of information to recognize is that a meningococcal rash is a non-blanching rash. So in the picture, you can see that the doctor is pressing a piece of glass against the child's rash. And you can see that the rash is still persisting. So this means it's a non-blanching rash, and that is key and characteristic of a meningococcal rash. So this could be a non-blanching petite rash or purpuric rash. So petite look like fine, fine print small dots, whereas purpura is more of a flat to widespread rash. Also, you need to recognise that it's a widespread hemorrhagic red-brown rash. So blood cultures and PCR is needed for meningococcus. A lumbar puncture is contraindicated in, menin in meningococcal septicemia. OK, so I hope you got that right. If you if you didn't, well, now, you know, uh, let's move on to the second one. So again, I'll give you 10 seconds or you can pause the screen. OK, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of erythema marginatum. So erythema marginatum is a very classic sign of rheum rheumatic fever. So rheumatic fever is caused by streptococcus pyogenes infection, which occurred two to six weeks prior to the presentation of this rash. Now, the key features of rheumatic fever are described as part of their major and minor criteria. So to be diagnosed with erythema marginatum, you can present with either two pieces of the major criteria or present with one aspect of the major criteria and then with two aspects of the minor criteria. So you're probably thinking what's major criteria and what's minor criteria. So the major criteria includes erythema marginatum and therefore an example of everything marsh atom is found in the top left hand corner. Other examples are syndrome choreus, this is like a dance like movement, polyarthritis, so stiffness in multiple joints, carditis valvulitis, so inflammation of the cardiac muscle itself or inflammation of the cardiac valves, and the and also subcutaneous nodules that's present along the skin. 
Minor criteria involves raised ESR and CRP, so these are your inflammatory markers. Fever, or you can describe it as a pyrexia, it means exactly the same thing. Arthralgia, so again that joint stiffness, and a prolonged PR interval, so that's your first degree heart block. Okay, so let's move on to the third one. So you can pause your screen, or you can wait until 10 seconds has passed, it's entirely up to you. Okay, let's find out the answer for number three. So number three is an example of a salmon patch. So this is the most common birthmark found in paediatrics. It's a flat pink raised birthmark, typically found on the forehead, the eyelids or the neck, and it tends to fade away after a few months of life. So if you find a baby presenting with this rash, you can reassure the parents it isn't something that's pathological, it isn't something that's going to impair their development, it's nothing really sinister to worry about. It, it will fade away after a few months of life. So that's number three. So let's move on to number four. Okay, so I hope you've written down your answer. Let's find out what it is. So number four is an example of an Epstein-Barr virus or human herpes 4 virus infection. So this viral infection can either lead to infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever. So in infectious mononucleosis, patients will present with exudative pharyngitis fever and lymphadenopathy and in glandular fever there's a triad of sore throat pyrexia and lymphadenopathy now you can see that this rash isn't particularly a key feature of either condition but what you need to recognize is that this rash is caused by an Epstein-Barr virus infection or it's also known as human herpes virus 4 infection and these viruses can lead to either infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever. So that's the key aspect to remember with this condition. And whether or not the patient presents with glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis will depend on the other symptoms that they're presenting with. So if you're thinking glandular fever, they need to have this triad. If you're considering infectious mononucleosis, you need to consider fever, lymphadenopathy and exudative pharyngitis. OK, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, so let's find out the answer. So this is an example of mumps. So the hallmark feature of mumps are painful parotid glands. Other features include fever, headache, and loss of appetite. The key thing to remember with mumps is this painful parotid gland, and that will be the key phrase that you'll find in the SBA, and that should immediately switch on the light bulb in your brain to make you pick mumps, Pick that answer, move on to the next question. You haven't got time to waste. Okay, so let's find out what number six is. Okay, let's find out the answer. So I've alluded to it here, but what you can see are coplic spots, so those white little salt grain like circular pieces on the inside of the mouth, so lining the buccal cavity, is a coplic spot. And that's classic of measles. So whenever you find any sort of description in the SBA alluding to a coplic spot, so it might describe it as white spots or a salt grain like mass lining the buccal mucosa. That should, again, switch on the light bulb, make you pick measles, and then move on to the next question because you haven't got time to waste. Other key features of measles that you need to be aware of is that measles is caused by the paramyoxia virus. So I've highlighted that in red because that's something that you definitely need to know. 
And so measles presents with a macular papillary rash initially behind the ears, which then spreads to the whole body over three to four days. Now this rash becomes quite blotchy and it tends to disquaminate, particularly in the second week of life, sorry, in the second week of infection. Now the hallmark feature of measles, like I've previously said, is coplic spots. So as soon as you get any sort of description alluding to a coplic spot, pick measles, move on to the next question, okay? So I'll give you about 10 seconds or you can pause the video, it's up to you. Okay, let's find out the answer. Okay, so this rash is hand to foot and mouth disease. It's caused by the Coxsackie virus and that's something that you definitely need to know for your exams and that's why I've highlighted it in red. So it presents the vesicles found on the mouth, the palms and the soles of the feet. So that's why I had a picture involving the hands and the feet. It can also present as an arithmetous macular and papular rash. Now, the key thing to remember for hand, foot, mouth disease is that children do not need to be excluded from school unless the child feels unwell themselves. And that's quite important because we'll later on discuss another rash where children will have to be excluded from school. But try to remember hand, foot and mouth disease, Coxsackie virus, vesicles found on, on the mouth, the palms and soles of the feet and no school exclusion is needed. OK, let's move on to the next rash. So again, you can pause the video or wait 10 seconds, it's up to you. Okay, so this is an example of Rosiella infantum. So Rosiella infantum is caused by the human herpes virus type 6. So Typically, a child will present with a sudden high fever. The fever will be greater than 39 degrees. And this fever will persist over three to five days and then rapidly the fever will fall. Now, once the fever has disappeared, then the macular papillar rash will present. So the rash will present on the chest and then spread to the limbs. Okay, so let's move on to rash number nine. So again, you've got 10 seconds or you can pause the video. It's entirely up to you. Okay, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of a capillary malformation or a port wine stain. So a child will present with a dark red or purple flat birthmark. It's commonly found on the face, the chest or the back. Now this rash will increase in size during puberty, during pregnancy or the menopause. Okay, so let's move on to the next rash, please. So I'll give you 10 seconds or you can pause the video, it's entirely up to you. Okay, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of chickenpox. So chickenpox is caused by the varicella zoster virus and that's something that's really, really important because that comes up again time and time again in the exam, so please make sure you know that. So a child will have a persistent fever for two days and then the rash develops. So initially this rash is a macular rash and then it becomes papular, then it becomes vesicular and then finally it scabs over. So children who are suffering from chickenpox need to be excluded for five days from the onset of the rash or until all of the lesions have scabbed over. Now, like I said, you might have an exam question which asks you about school exclusion in terms of chickenpox. And chickenpox is very, very infectious. It's, it's extremely important to remember that there's a five day exclusion from the onset of the rash or until all of the, until all of the lesions have scabbed over. OK, so let's move on to rash number 11.
Okay, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of infantile hemangioma, or it's also known as a strawberry mark. So this is a red raised birthmark found anywhere on the body. It increases in size for the first six months of life, and then it shrinks and disappears by the time the child reaches the age of seven. Okay. So number 12, again, you can pause the video or you can wait until 10 seconds and you'll find out the answer. Okay, so let's find out the answer. So this is an example of molluscum contagiosum. So molluscum contagiosum is caused by the molluscum contagiosum virus. So that's qu hopefully quite a nice, easy virus for you to remember. And it's important that you remember the name of the virus and that's why I've highlighted it in red. So molluscum contagiosum typically presents as pearl-like papules or dome-shaped lesions with central indentation. And that's a very classic description which will be embedded within the SBA. So please try to remember that. Now, sometimes these dome-shaped lesions can be umbilicated and they're typically found on the face, the neck, the axilla and the thighs. OK, so well done for keeping up. So we're on rush number 12 and we've only got eight more to go. OK, so well done. Let's move on to number 13. Okay, so let's find out the answer for this. So this is an example of candida dermatitis, and this is um, commonly known as diaper rash, but as you can see, it's quite severe. So this is an arithmetic rash involving the flexures. Now the hallmark key feature that you absolutely 100% need to remember for this condition is that the child will present with satellite lesions. So if you look at the picture, you can see an arrow and you've got a description of satellite lesions, they tend to be a flat, pink, circular, isolated rash. And whenever you see any sort of description alluding to a satellite lesion, or if you find a picture presenting with a satellite lesion, that should immediately, immediately switch on the light bulb, make a click send candida dermatitis, and then you can move on to the next question. OK, these are key, key features that you need to remember because pediatric rashes are quite easy once you know them. They're quite easy marks. Okay, so number 14. Okay, let's find out the answer. So this is an example of scabies. So scabies is caused by a sarcophyte scabi and the hallmark key features are linear burrows. So these linear burrows are found in the interdigital spaces. So that's the uh, web spaces between each fingers. It's found on the flexor aspects of the wrists and the child will have widespread pruritus. So they might be complaining that they're unable to sleep all night because they've constantly been itching and scratching themselves. Now the key Hallmark feature scabies are linear burrows. So as you can see across all three pictures there are examples of linear burrows. OK, so whenever there's a description of linear burrows, tick scabies, move on to the next question. OK, you've got this. The exam paper will be easier. All right, so number 15. Again, pause the video if you like, or you can wait until 10 seconds has passed and I'll give you the answer. OK, so this is an example of crusted scabies or Norwegian scabies. So this is an example of scabies in occurring only in immunocompromised patients. This is more this is a far more severe form compared to scabies caused by sarcophyte scabi in the on the previous slide. So crusted or Norwegian scabies typically occurs in patients who are immunocompromised, so they might be suffering from HIV, they might have a leukemia, they might be undergoing chemo radiotherapy for cancer. So rather than having linear burrows, these patients will have crusted pieces of skin, which are quite grey in colour, and these crusted areas will then crumble and flake off very easily. Okay, so key thing to remember 
is that this is found only in immunocompromised patients. Okay, let's move on to ration number 16. So again, you can either pause the video, otherwise you've got 10 seconds. Okay, so this is an example of impetigo. So impetigo is caused by either a Staphylococcus aureus infection or Streptococcus pyogenes infection. So again, important to know for your exams, that's why it's highlighted in red. So children will typically, will typically present with these red sores around their mouth and nose, and then yellow, brown, golden crusted lesions will develop. Sometimes in the exams, they might describe it as a honey colored crested lesion. And again, the honey colored, I think, is alluding to this golden brown color. So just be aware of that. So within Patigo, children need to avoid school until all the lesions are dry and crusted or 48 hours after beginning the antibiotics. So again, really important, please remember, within Patigo, children need to avoid school until all the lesions are dry and crusted or 48 hours after beginning the antibiotics. Okay, so let's move on to ration number 17. So this is an example of erythema infectiosum. So erythema infectiosum is caused by a parvovirus B19 infection. So it's really important that you remember the name of this virus. So children will present with an erythematous slapped cheek appearance. So it looks like someone's just smacked them across both cheeks, which obviously isn't the case, but that's just a description of how the rash presents. So the rash spreads from the cheeks and the facial region to the proximal arms and then to the extensor surfaces. Now, for erythema infectiosum, no school exclusion is needed, okay? So the key thing that I want you to take away from this slide is that erythema infectiosum is caused by parvovirus B19. It presents with a slack cheek appearance and no school exclusion is needed, okay? Let's move on to ration number eight. So again, you can either pause the video, otherwise you've got 10 seconds. Okay. So this is an example of Seberhardt dermatitis. So this is an arithmetic rash with yellow scales and flakes, and it develops in the first few weeks of life. Another term for describing Seberhardt dermatitis is a cradle cap. Now, a cradle cap is more of a colloquial slang term. So in the exam, if you have any sort of description of a rash with yellow scales, yellow flakes, think immediately, Seberhardt dermatitis, pick that answer, move on to the next question, okay? These are really, really easy marks. So number 19, you've got 10 seconds, otherwise you can pause the video. So this is an example of rubella. So rubella is caused by the RNA togger virus. It's a pink macular papular rash. Initially presents on the face and then spreads to the rest of the body. Now the key thing to remember with rubella is that patients will also present with suboccipital and posterior lymphadenopathy. So they've got enlarged lymph nodes behind the ear and on the back of the head near the occipital region. Okay, so let's move on to the last rash, rash number 20. So you can pause the video, otherwise you've got 10 seconds. Okay. So this is an example of scarlet fever. So scarlet fever is caused by a streptococcus pyogenes infection, and that's really, really important for you to remember. Children will present with a strawberry tongue, so the tongue will appear strawberry-like, so it's got very prominent papillae, uh, very bright red tongue, as seen in the picture below. They'll also complain of this pink, red, sandpaper-like rash, so the rash will feel quite rough to the touch in terms of its texture, and that's what it's alluding to in terms of the sandpaper-like rash. Also, there'll be a fine punctuate arithmetic rash with circumoral pallor. So that means you've got 
a very fine reddish pinkish rash on the cheeks and around the nose area but it's sparing the mouth region as you can see in the picture below. Now we've gone through the top 20 high yield paediatric rashes that crop up in finals. Thank you for staying with me for so long and now I've got examples of five practice SBAs so it's up to you, you can either pause the video, go away to get a sip of tea, drink a bit of water, you can refresh yourself or if you want to plow on and continue then that's what I'm going to do. Okay so the choice is up to you, you can have a little break beforehand or you can continue with the video. Okay so let's make a start on the SBAs. So number one, a three-year-old child presents with a fever and a rash. The rash is found mostly on its trunk and is made up of papules, vesicles and pustules. There are lots of scratch marks over its torso. The onset of the fever coincides with the rash. Is this rash Rosalia and Phantom, Rubella, Varicella zoster, hand, foot and mouth disease or Kawasaki disease? So I'll give you 10 seconds. So this rash is due to a varicella zoster virus infection, or commonly known as chickenpox. So we know that this is chickenpox because it's describing papules, vesicles and pustules. So again, it's showing that this rash is evolving, it's changing, because typically chickenpox will initially present with a macular rash, then it becomes papular, then vesicular, and then finally it will, it will become um, sort of discratious. And also the fact that there's lots of scratch marks over his torso describes that the rash is very itchy and chickenpox is known to be quite an itchy rash. So that's why this example is a varicella zoster virus infection, a chicken vi uh, sorry, chickenpox infection. Okay, let's move on to number two. So again, I'll give you 10 seconds for this. So a two-year-old boy presents with a fever and a rash. Five days ago, he came in contact with a girl at nursery who had a similar rash. His mother said that after this contact, he became miserable and had a runny nose. A few days later, he developed a pink rash moving from his face all the way down to his trunk. Okay. So 10 seconds is up now, so I'll go through the answer. So this is an example of measles, okay? Because you've got the chorizo-like symptoms, so that's the, the runny nose and the fever and the flu-like symptoms. And then you've got this pink rash from the face moving down to the trunk. So hopefully you got this right, and that's why it's measles. And another key aspect of this rash is that the fact that he's got white spots in his mouth. So that's describing the coplic spots so remember, whenever you see any description of coplic spots, it's either white spots or salt grain, like lesion in the buccal cavity, so the mouth, that should switch on the light bulbs and make you think, gosh, this answer is easy, it's measles, I'll take this answer and I'll move on. Okay? So number three, so a three-year-old child presents with a fever and a rash. A day prior to admission, she had been a little irritable with a high fever. She has vomited once. On the following morning, she was not rousable and had a red rash over her lower limbs. On examination, she is cold and tachycardic with a capillary refill time of five seconds. So I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, so this example is of meningococcal sepsis. So we've got fever and rash, the child is irritable, and then the following morning she's not rousable. So that should immediately switch on light bulbs in your brain and make you think that this child's GCS score has deteriorated. She's not rousable. And well, she's got this red rash over her lower limbs. So you should definitely be concerned. Then then the exam question states that her capillary refill time is five seconds. Now, a normal capillary time 
is less than two seconds. So if her capillary refill time is a five seconds, then that shows that there is a severe degree of dehydration occurring and she's cold and tachycardic, so she's definitely moving in shock. So out of all of these different possible options, if some of you were a little bit unsure whether it's meningococcal sepsis or meningococcal meningitis, whilst this patient does appear shocked, so that, that definitely points more towards meningococcal sepsis and she's got a um, degree of dehydration, so the prolonged capillary refill time, the key aspect that helps to exclude that it's not a meningococcal meningitis is that she doesn't have the typical features of meningitis. So the typical features of meningitis involves photophobia, so bright lights, hurt in the eyes, phonophobia, so again, noise is being very painful to hear, headache, neck stiffness, or this neutral rigidity that's also described in the textbooks. Okay, so those are the key features of meningitis which aren't present in this text and hopefully you can use that to help exclude the answers. Okay, so the answer to this question was meningococcal sepsis. Okay, let's move on to question number four. So a four-year-old child presents with a fever and a rash. He'd been a little hot this morning. But his mother sent him to nursery after giving him some paracetamol. She is now brought into the emergency department because she is concerned he has been slapped around the face at nursery. Okay, so I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, so this example is of erythrovirus or sometimes it's known as fifth disease. So this is an example of erythrovirus caused by the parvirus B19 infection. So as soon as you see that slapped cheek description, so in the bottom line where the mother's concerned that the baby is being slapped around the face at nursery, that's describing a slap cheek appearance and that should make you think this is an example of erythrovirus caused by parvirus B19 infection, okay? So let's move on to SBA number five. This is the final SBA. So a two-year-old boy presents with fever and rash. His mother is concerned that he's having an allergic reaction as he's been hot all day. He has a red rash that feels like goose pimples and now his tongue is red and swollen. On examination, he has an inflamed pharynx. Okay, so I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, so this is an example of scarlet fever. So going back to the question, so the child's got a fever, he's got a red swollen tongue, so that's your strawberry tongue. He's got a rash that feels like goose pimples, so that's a very broad description of a sandpaper like rash. It's trying to, I think, get across that the rash is quite rough in texture. And also the inflamed pharynx, again, helps to underline that the child has this strawberry tongue. OK, so hopefully you got this right and hopefully that's helped your understanding of pediatric rash today. So these are the references. But um, what I want to say, thank you for staying with me. I appreciate it's been quite a long video. And I just wanted to say that if you've enjoyed my video today, if you've enjoyed my previous videos, please hit the like button, subscribe to my YouTube channel and post in the comment section below and please share my video and my channel with all of your friends and I wish you all the best for your finals. Thank you very much for joining me today.